I would invite all those who can to kneel before the Lord for an opening prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the gift of the Sabbath day that we have the chance to stop, to come to your house of prayer, to commune together, to worship you. I pray, Father, for forgiveness for our sins. I pray for the presence of your Holy Spirit with us, for your direction and inspiration. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everybody. A hearty welcome to all our regular members and to our visitors. Please come back and worship with us as often as you can. This morning, we're going to start off with number 635 for our opening hymn. 635. And shall we stand? Oh, wait, that's not right. 625. Yes. Sorry, 625. <clears throat> Higher ground. I'm pressing toward the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I onward bound. My faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. My heart has no desire to stay where doubts arise and fears dismay. Though some may dwell where these abound, my prayer, my aim is higher. Lift me up and I shall stand My faith on heaven's table land A higher plane than I have found Lord, plant my feet on higher ground I want to live above the world Though Satan's darts at me are heard For faith has called joyful sound, the song of saints on higher ground. Me up and I shall stand, my faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to scale the utmost height, and catch a gleam of glory bright. But still I'll pray till heaven I found. Lord, lead me on to higher ground. Let's hear it now. Lord, lift me up and I shall stand. My faith on heaven's table land. A higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher Amen. Oh, you came through beautiful on that last one. You sounded good. Amen. All right. Uh, I want to remind you, you can deposit your tithes and offerings in the box out there in the foyer, or you can give it to our treasurer, Chris, back there in the shirt, checkered shirt. Okay, let us uh, kneel for prayer this morning, and I need to find my prayer requests. Okay, uh, Brother Lewis, where are they? Green room. So. <clears throat> Our most gracious and kind Heavenly Father, hallowed be thy holy name. Amen. We thank you, Father, for another day of life you've given us in your only begotten Son. We ask that you would please forgive us of our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness, make us fit vessels to be filled with your Holy Spirit, 
We thank you for your many blessings throughout the week, Lord. And we have special prayer requests. We are thinking corporately here of Amos and the situation that he's in. We ask, Father, for your will to be done here, that if it's in your will, that you would raise him up from his bed of affliction and restore him to us and to his family. Uh, we want to pray for the situation with Samuel, that the government would be moved to allow him to return from Mexico. Amen. We pray for our sister, Joy St. John, and also for Shirley's niece. We pray, Father, for each and every one of us. We all have individual heart requests that uh, we present them before you now and ask that you'll answer each one according to your will. And Lord, we have a special box here that contains letters to the U.S. government. We ask that your blessing be with these, that they would find their way uh, safely and quickly to the appropriate official or officials and we ask that your Holy Spirit would soften hearts and permit the reunification of Samuel with his family here. We pray for all these things, Father, and also, Lord, we ask for your Holy Spirit to anoint our pastor <clears throat> and to uh, open up our hearts and our minds to the message you have for us today. We pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Okay, if you would please take your Bibles and turn to 1 Samuel 16, not 6, 1 Samuel 16 and verse 13 is our opening scripture for this morning. 1 Samuel 16 and verse 13. <clears throat> Once again, 1 Samuel 16, verse 13. Still here a couple pages. Are we about ready? Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up <clears throat> and went to Ramah. Amen. Happy Sabbath, all of you. It's good to see you all. And um, even those that are visiting today, it's good to re-see you or to see you for the first time. We have a very packed day today with several things happening. Um, we are going to have an ordination of uh, one of our elders. And um, then we'll have a message that will be reflecting upon the importance of uh, anointment and ordination. I know this is probably a topic that is a little bit sometimes theological, but we will be trying to get it to the simple level. Uh, so our ceremony, I would like to explain a little bit. Uh, ordination, there are more than a hundred passages in the Bible about ordination and or anointing even more. Uh, and ordination and anointing are to do with several um, um, activities of the church. For instance, this week we were there with Brother Amos and uh, we anointed him. Uh, now, some people bring reminiscence from Catholic Church and they believe that when you do that is the extreme anointment and the person is going to die. But in the context of the biblical teachings in uh, James uh, chapter 5, verse 13 to 17, it's shown that is to open up and unblock the ways for the healing or for the cleansing for whatever uh, the Lord feels as is his will. Then I visited him again, I think it was Wednesday or Thursday, and I had a very nice experience with him. He told me about a dream he had. And as the Lord was reassuring him of several things, he was very encouraged with that dream. He says that in the dream, the Lord changed some things in his room that we understood. The Lord took the clock out and we understood the Lord was meaning that time is not an issue for God. So whether it's time for healing or if it's time to go, eternity is what is safe for him. And the light in the room was shift. He shared that with me. I found it very beautiful. 
and he says, this is what happened in my life after that dream. I started seeing the gospel. The Lord took me to revisit my life, and I started seeing the gospel in a new light. I understand new things now. This was very encouraging. I just wanted to share. So anointing can be for the healing. Uh, keep in mind that in those days, they didn't have perfume uh, or, or a cologne. So that was uh, something that was a nice aroma and smelling good. And they will use also as something that will make the person feel and look good. Uh, also, it represents the oil we know, represents the Holy Spirit. And so is the acknowledgement of the Holy Spirit. When we anoint somebody, we are acknowledging the work of the Holy Spirit upon that person. If we are accompanying that with the laying of hands, we are also, uh, it may represent receiving the Holy Spirit. We saw Paul doing that, Jesus doing that, Acts 6 tells us about that, Acts 8 also, but also it means the passing on the entrusting of authority. It's like in a baton race, you know, when the first athlete starts running, then he passes on the baton to the next athlete. So we believe that this church is a church in a chain of command, in a sequence of authority. We just didn't come up out of the blue and say, okay, I'm a pastor now, I'm an elder now, it doesn't matter if anybody will see me like so, but I want to be that. Or it doesn't matter if the majority is seeing me like that, that's not what makes it. The process starts in heaven with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit selected the one that was going to replace Judas, you remember that. They prayed about it and he showed them and then they anointed him and laid hands on him. So what we do on earth is the recognition of what started in heaven. That's what it says in Matthew 16. And uh, a lot of people say that Jesus placed Peter as the head of the church. We saw that James was the head of the church. What Jesus was saying is that the process starts there. So I know it's an operation that is quite dangerous because they are in several activities in the room. But I'm going to invite the elders of the church to come forward. Not only those that are in service, but all those that have ever been ordained as an elder, even if you're not from this church, if you are an ordained elder, I would like you to please come forward at this moment. And we have two new elders. We have Brother Abdiel. Brother Abdiel, could you uh, set the example and come forward uh, while the others are coming? And we have Brother Matthew is helping us with the sound. Uh, those were... Uh, the two nominated elders, and we have the elders that uh, were already nominated. And uh, the manual encourages to, as soon as possible, ordain those that were not ordained yet. Um, Brother Matt asked us, he says he humbly wants to serve, but he also wants to be more prepared still. So he asked us to take more time for that, and we are respecting that. And uh, we appreciate, in fact, that. It, it shows that he's taking serious his responsibility. And uh, Brother Abdiel has been with a lot of uh, other backgrounds and experience. I know it's a little bit tight here. Uh, basically, when we lay hands upon the other that has been ordained, what we are saying is that the authority that was bestowed upon us by another elder or pastor, we are now acknowledging that the church is acknowledge him as with a call from Jesus for that. We are now passing also that authority, which will be uh, enabling him to start the work in a, a setting, okay? So this is what we will do. All this started by Jesus. So Jesus laid his hand the, upon the disciples, then they went and were laying hands when they will transfer authority. Now, it may be for several tasks. For instance, if I'm ordaining a deaconess, it doesn't mean that now she can do anything uh, other tasks. We are ordaining for a specific thing. In this case, we are ordaining him for eldership. Eldership in the Bible is very similar to pastorship. They, are, they go hand in hand. And we have some information on that. I don't want to make this a boring ceremony, so I'm not going to read all the church manual. But I would like to give us uh, some insight on that. Uh, and in fact, even before the church manual, we could start with uh, 1 Timothy talks about eldership. I'm going to just read some topics there. 1 Timothy 3, it says, A bishop must 
be blameless, given to hospitality. We've, we've proven that on you, so we know that. And one that ruled well his own house, having his children in subjection, so John, get ready, uh, with all gravity, a man known not, if a man knows not how to rule his house, cannot rule a church, then he says he must have a good report into reproach and uh, the snare of the devil he will um, cast away. Likewise, he must, must not be double-tongued, not slanderer, and ruling his children and his own house well. Um, and this is the characteristics. Then the manual expands a little bit onto that, and I'm just going to read also some parts. Um, it says that uh, they are spiritual leaders with good reputation, serving as assistants under and in cooperation with the pastor in a ministry of visitation, worship leadership, spiritual mentoring, and church administration, working harmoniously in council with the pastor to conduct service, minister in word and doctrine, visit people, minister to the sick, encourage the disheartened, foster Bible studies, prayer ministries, and anointing services and dedications, faithfully tithing and in a personal relationship with Jesus. This is the summary. You can read more about it in the church manual if you want to know more. There's information about all of that. And in the Bible, of course, you have the source where we got that information. So at this moment, I will do this. I'm going to ask Brother Abdiel to kneel. I'm going to lay hands upon him, and the elders will uh, be in a chain touching each other like we are sharing the ministry and sharing the vision together. And I will invite you there to kneel with us, and we will be having a word of prayer upon him. And this laying of hands is with this specific goal to pass and uh, ignite this moment with him. I'm going to, uh, I don't know, uh, you want to record, if you want to come also, his wife is very a very important part of the ministry, so if she can come and bring John, if you can, it's okay. We will be praying also for the family. This is very important. Uh, I can tell you that half of, of the, his eldership will be your wife, okay? It's a lot that uh, they can do for us. So if you are close enough to him, you can lay hands upon him also. If not, you can lay hand on the elder that is nearby you. Let us pray together. Father in heaven, at this moment we approach you in the name of Jesus. There's only one way we can come before you, and it is uh, the name of Jesus. I pray for forgiveness for our sins, my sins, all of us as elders, and especially now for Brother Abdiel and Sister Chantel and John, the family hold that you have established. At this moment, Father, we not only pray for forgiveness, but we pray for your grace of empowerment. We acknowledge that you have called uh, Brother Abdiel to eldership. We want you to please lead his life, inspire his ministry. We acknowledge as a church that this is a gift and a call. And at this moment, in representation of the church, we want to pass the baton forward. We want to ask, Father, that your Holy Spirit may come upon him, that your protection may come upon his family, that your inspiration and leading may come upon all of them, that they may know they will be now specially attacked by the devil. The devil will try to discourage them, will try to have them fail, but that they may never, never let this bring them down, that they may cling to you and hold on tight, and that you may empower them to perform these duties. I pray for this blessing as we lay hands upon him and upon the family, that you may answer our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. By the end of uh, the service, you can uh, share your words of encouragement with him.
And in this sequence, I thought it would be appropriate for us to talk a little bit about the meaning of what I called as a title, the anointed rod. You can also say the anointed staff. The staff goes in the double meaning, right? The staff or the staff that is being anointed. And uh, I'm going to try to make this uh, very uh, practical, but I would like us to understand, we were going to read many texts because there's an important topic that is very related to this and that we should uh, be aware of. Um, to start up, and even before we go into the sermon, I would like to start with a children's story. And uh, I believe I might have told this story in Parsons right in the beginning of our ministry here, but I know that many of you were not there, and this is one of my favorite stories. In fact, I'm going to be honest, I'm not going to tell these stories just to the kids, okay? Is it okay, Seth? Can I tell it to the adults also? This is one of my favorite stories. It passes in, I think, in China or an Asian country. And uh, the point of the matter is that the emperor had no children. And they were all concerned because he was, he was getting to a certain age and there was nobody to keep going uh, with the dynasty. And so everybody was concerned. And the emperor was approached with that and he said, okay, he gathered the counselors and started talking to them what was the solution. And they came up with an excellent idea. And they started putting that idea to practice. And the idea was to call all the young men uh, from a certain age on in the country and bring them to a simple test that will define who would be the next emperor. So uh, they sent edits to all the kingdom and the knights were running their horses and taking the messages and conclaiming everybody to gather there for this special day. And as they gathered there, all the young men were aligned very reverently and the emperor came and started telling them, young man, you were called here today because I have no descendants and we need to keep going with the dynasty. So today, one of you is the blessed one that will be having the chance to be the next emperor in our uh, dominion. And he says, and this will be done by a very simple test. Each one of you will receive a little uh, vessel with some dirt in and a seed and I will give you that seed and you will have to take care of that seed and when I call you again we will see who will have who has the best results on that seed and um, the one that has the best results as the counselors evaluate that will be the next emperor so the young man received from the officials a little vessel with dirt and a little seed, and they went to their original uh, cities and uh, villages, and after a while, they will be called. Well, our story is going to focus on this young man, and this young man, he was in fact a gardener, and he was so enthusiastic, he thought, oh, this is such a a nice honor, even if I don't become the emperor, just to serve my country like that. So he planted the seed and he was choosing the best soil, the best conditions. He chose the best nutrients for the dirt and he was starting to take care of that little seed. And one week passed, two weeks passed, three weeks passed, and by the time the seeds should start to come up, nothing was happening. And he started to get concerned. He went and got better uh, nutrients for the dirt, better ways. He talked to his parents, what do you think I should do? And they told him, you should probably do this and do that. And he was doing all his best. He was running against the clock. He was seeing time passing. And soon the emperor will call them again. And he had nothing. He said, oh man, I thought I could understand a little bit of gardening because that's something I work with, but I'm not being successful. You gardeners know the frustration, right? Right, Doug? 
when you plant something and it's not coming up, that's how this man was feeling. And the young man. And the day was approaching. The heralds came again to say, tomorrow all of you, or the following day, had to be there and present to the emperor. And he got now really concerned. And he told his mom, oh, I think I won't go. And mommy said, no. And daddy said, no. You did your best. You have nothing to fear. You did your best. I said, no, how come I have nothing to fear? This is the emperor. She said, you did your best. So you have now to face whatever happens because that's all you could do. You did that, and now whatever comes, that's it. So he filled himself with courage and carried his little vessel and went there. And as he arrived there, he was seeing awesome plants. Big ones, larger ones, green leaves, the best plants. He was like, oh my, and now I'm just, just a little vessel with dirt there, nothing coming up. And he was feeling really ashamed. And some people would look at him like, hmm. And it was like really bad. So he stayed right at the end of all the line. And uh, everybody is aligned. And the heralds played the trumpet. The emperor showed up and say, you know why we are here. We have uh, explained this before. So today, we're going to choose the emperor, the new emperor. And so the emperor start going and analyzing and seeing all those beautiful plants here and there. And it was passing very solemnly. And he was almost hiding, you know, before a big plant there, seeing if the emperor will not see him. But as the emperor was really passing all through, suddenly looked at him and stopped and said, young man, what is that? And he said, with a trembling voice, your honor, I did my best, I, this is, I did all I could. And all the eyes now turn into him and he's feeling really bad. And the emperor said, guards, take him up. And now he is really saying, okay, that's the end of it. I knew, I told mommy, well, well, I did my best. I need, he started thinking about what mom told him. I did my best and the guards just carrying him forward and the emperor comes back and everybody is now in silence, silence. And everybody looks at him as the emperor said, young man, what you did has consequences. And he said, I know. I need my best, so I will face whatever consequences. And then the emperor turned and said, all of you, I want you to publicly know this is your new emperor. All the seeds you took were killed. There was no way they could blossom anything. This was the only man that was truthful to what he took and brought what he really could achieve. All those beautiful plants there, I know is not the seed I gave you because those seeds were killed before we gave you. So he was the only one that really was honest to what he could bring through. You know, sometimes we tend to read things by how flourishing the leaves are how green they look, how opulent they appear. And we might be taken to do that also with people. You know, some people, they look like they're great people. And others, they look like they're nothing. And we might be tending to do that also with church. And we might think we have a good church because we have a big church or we have an active church or we might think that we have a bad church because we have this or that problem. Today I would like to take you to a little trip. You know, anointing or laying of hands will be used when they would dedicate a new prophet, when they would seal a marriage, when they will heal the sick, to choose a king, to consecrate, uh, as I said, a prophet, or to empower leadership. Leadership in the Bible is represented by the number 12. And I would like to bring you to a little trip for you to really start thinking about this. You have, for instance, the 12 sons of Jacob. Can you think about any other number 12 in the Bible? The 12 disciples. Jesus started the leadership of the new church with 12 disciples. And he started the leadership of the Old Testament with 12 what? Tribes. 
those 12 tribes have 12 princes. And for instance, when they went to spy the new land, what did they send? 12 spies. Now, I want you to notice something very interesting. From the 12 spies that went to spy the land, how many were faithful in their report? Two. From the 12 sons of Jacob, how many were faithful and not gossipers or intriguers and all that? You can say one and put Benjamin also together. Two. From the 12 disciples, how many remained with Jesus when Jesus was going to the terrible hour? One. This is probably telling you something about leadership. Sometimes we think that just because we see a lot of problems in leadership, they are not the ones. But you see, Jesus still works with whatever he has. Let me give you a little illustration for you to understand. Let's say you have a company, and your company has 12 managers, and all of them are crooks except two. What will you do? Would you go to the news, you know, prime time, and say, hey, I want to tell you, don't buy from my company because most of my managers, 10 of them are crooks. Is this what you do? What would you do? You try little by little to replace those managers to get your company going so that you are not going to shame your name. You know, a lot of people look at the church and see a lot of problems and think that the best way is to go and lift up the trumpet and announce the sins that are there. Because you see a lot of crooks, a lot of hypocrisy, and all that. But I'll tell you, Jesus compares the church and Jesus to what? Husband and wife. I am married. My wife is not perfect. But I will not really be happy if you go around telling everybody about the defects of my wife. I don't think that will save my marriage. I don't think that will make my wife better. And honestly, I don't think that God will also be happy that we go and gossip and spread around the problems of his wife. God is showing us in the Bible that he's working to present her blameless to the Father. Not for us to show and expose all the blames of the church. I want us to understand some things about what I'm saying this morning because this is very, very important. Sometimes we think we are saving the day. And I know by this time you're probably intrigued. What is the pastor going to talk about? Well, I'm going to talk about the anointment that our church received and the importance of that in spite of the problems we might have. And, uh, you know, a lot of things were created in mysticism about what is this anointment. For instance, we have, in the Middle Ages, status was attached to the church. Uh, we had this, the nobles and the peasants, you know, and the nobleman, the firstborn son, will become a noble and inherit everything. But they had other sons, so they started thinking, how am I going to have my son also getting something? So they said, the best way is to send him to clergy. But the problem with clergy, he will be put at the same level as everybody else, all the other peasants. So they started inventing the difference between clergy and lay people. That's when the platforms came to the church. You know, in Israel, there was no platform. And a way to show that I'm up here, that's when Latin start coming into the church so that you don't understand what I'm talking about so that you feel you are nothing and I'm very important. That's when they start saying the Bible is only for some people. So this was a way for the devil to strike the church in what the Lord put as leadership. And the Bible clearly tells us in Matthew 20, 26, I'm going to mention many texts. We're not going to read all of them. This one I'm just going to mention, you know. So whosoever... Be the great among you, let him be also your servant or minister. But I know that some people feel this is one extreme, and I know that some people feel the other extreme. Some say leadership, that's something from the past. There's no such a thing as 
hierarchy in the church, there will be no hierarchy in heaven. I want to start by saying that maybe we need to read our Bible better. We have angels, archangels, seraphims, cherubims, all kind of classes. And the spirit prophecy in the book, um, uh, my, my favorite book, History of Redemption or Story of Redemption, she says that God gathered all the angels in squads and they had one angel at the top being the leader. And Michael, the archangel, arc means the top of, he is the leader of all the angels, the chief of all the angels. So we have archangels and the arc archangel. So we see there's a hierarchy in heaven. The point is that the earthly hierarchy is negative. We try to oppress the ones on the bottom, while the heavenly hierarchy is the other way around. The ones on top are the ones with bigger responsibilities and the ones to serve. Now, do we always do that? Of course not. We carry the mentality of the world. Some people say because of that, well, Galatians 3.28 says that in Christ there will be no Jew or no Greek, no American or Hispanic, no male or female. Ye are all in Christ Jesus. So why do we make differentiations between things? And people say in the New Testament, and I would like to read this text with you. I'm, I'm, I didn't bring PowerPoint. I would like us to have a very active, you know, old-fashioned old way, sermons that we flip our Bibles. I would like to hear the leaves of our Bibles just flipping back and forth. 1 Peter 2, 9. 1 Peter 2, 9. Some people say, this is the church in the New Testament. You see, in the Old Testament, we had all these kind of uh, classes, the Levites and this and that, but now we are all the same. This might not be exactly a biblical principle, if you see, but let's see. 1 Peter 2, 9, it says, But ye are the what? A chosen generation. A royal priesthood. Also say, oh, we are all pastors now. We are all elders now. We are all a royal priesthood. And holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness unto his marvelous light. So some people think, just because of this text and the previous one, the Galatians 1 and this one, that we are all the same. Everybody can baptize, everybody can get people married. In fact, I know some people, I had some friends when I was younger, that they did this. They were courting, and they just decided to get married. But they said, you know, pastors, you know, I don't trust those guys. Uh, we're going to take care of these our way. So they went home. Now, put one hand upon the other, prayed and declared themselves married before the Lord and got living together. In fact, I know people also that think that anybody can baptize. Because why do we have to have only certain people that can baptize the others cannot? We were all called. We are all the same before Christ. I know people that they decide and just baptize somebody. And I even know somebody that baptized himself. We come to a situation that we might get to some aspects that become a little bit ridiculous. Uh, so we don't need anything, we don't need any structure because this is freedom. We might have misconceptions of freedom. First, I would like us to clarify that it was not only in the New Testament that we were all called royal priesthood. This was not a change that Jesus brought that said, now everybody can do anything. If you go with me, to Exodus 19.6. Exodus, as far as I know, is Old Testament, right? Are you with me? Exodus is the second book in the Bible. Easy to find. Exodus 19.6. Look at the similitudes between the text that we read in the New Testament and the text that we read in the Old Testament. It says, And ye shall be unto me a what? Kingdom of priests. The others say royal priesthood. Royal means king. Okay? Kingdom of priests. And a holy nation. The other says a holy nation. And these are the words which you shall speak. So 
God has called Israel since the past to be a priesthood and a holy nation. But they had also priests. So one thing is not really making the other null, but they work together. I want us to realize that we had the Israelites, then within the Israelites we have a special tribe that was selected was the Levites. Within the Levites tribe we had a special class that was selected that was the priests. And then within the priest there was a special one that was selected that was a high priest. So you see, all the Israelites were called a holy nation, but still they had selections for specific things. So that will lead us to think that when Peter calls us also a holy nation and royal priesthood or kingdom priesthood, we are also in the same thing. It doesn't mean that we don't have specific roles or specific differentiations. We were called, the reason why we are called royal priesthood is two things. First, because we are called to take the message to the world and share the gospel. So we are all preachers. We are all ministers. Are you with me? But also because when we get to heaven, the human race, when the holy city comes down to this world, when Christ brings his throne to this world, we will be the royal priesthood of the universe. The Lord is telling you, I have saved you for a special mission. You are anointed for a special mission. Don't let Satan deceive you in the midst of the turmoils you have to go through. Abdiel, you were called for a special mission. You will find battles. There will be days that you will feel like I'm not worthy of ministering. I've felt these days many times. Don't let the devil bring this thought to your mind. None of us is worthy of any ministry. We seek the Lord for that. So when people start thinking that they are more worthy than the others in the church, whether it be the leadership, whether it be the church in general because of the apostasy in the church, they didn't understand the gospel. When we start feeling better than others, we don't look more like Christ. We look more like Satan. You see, Jesus was like God. He humbled himself. Satan was under Jesus, and he wanted to exalt himself. He felt better than anyone else. That is not the spirit of Christ that makes us feel that the church is with too much apostasy, and we cannot convey it. I want us to understand the second thing. The New Testament did not eliminate the different roles. 1 Corinthians 12, we all know, says that, Paul says in verse 29, Are we all apostles? Are we all prophets? Are we all teachers? Are we all working miracles? No. And then Ephesians 4.11 says, And he gave some for apostles, and some for prophets, and some for evangelists, and some for pastors and teachers. So we are all called as a holy priesthood. We are all called to preach and minister to the world. But that doesn't mean that we are all prophets and all ministers. I always tremble when I hear somebody saying, The Lord has shown me. When people talk like they have a prophetic gift, special, where they see things. And in fact, sometimes a lot of people, they just want to be more than others. And many of the things the Lord is showing them is in contradiction to the things the Lord has shown the body. I want you to understand what I'm talking about this morning. It's a very serious problem. You know... I have, I don't know if it's a quality or a defect. I usually say that our defects are really hand in hand with our qualities. Your biggest quality is probably also your biggest defect. You know, for instance, pastors, their quality is that they can speak. And sometimes they speak too much. Your biggest quality, sometimes you are a resilient person. And this downside of that is you're stubborn. You know? Your biggest quality is most of the times hand in hand with your biggest defect. I want us to understand this. I want to open up my heart again. When I came to the district, there was one split. A little bit after that, that split turned into another split. So we had three churches in the district. Loboville, Parsons, and Camden. From Loboville, a big split happened, and a lot of people left. 
and form an independent church. Some of them came from Camden also. A little bit after, I'm, I'm not criticizing, this is facts, I'm just telling you, reporting the, the, what happened. A little bit after, that split, split again and formed another church. So we had two independent churches in the same street. I'm becoming a little bit confused with the work of the Holy Spirit because he's inspiring people to go to a higher ground, but they don't agree then. But then you know what happened? From those churches, a lot of people are not even attending those churches now. They are all scattered in many small groups, church at home. We had already church at home in our area. But now, I'm not talking about church at home the way we had it. I'm talking about like everybody feels like we are the faithful ones. We are doing the job. We can baptize. We can make marriages. We can perform anything because we are all entitled to do so. And this has become a very puzzled, scattered understanding of Adventism. And this is why I, I was trying to bring this topic today. I once had the privilege to preach in a Reformed Adventism camp meeting. You know, the Reformed movement, they came out of Adventism in the 1914, 1915, the 1900s. And they felt they were needing to do a reform in the church, so they formed another Reformed movement for the Adventists. That also split later on into two more. More Reformation was needed. It's very rare to preach at, at one of those movements, but I had a privilege to preach. And at the end, we went to the house of one of the elders, and he was telling me, why are you still an Adventist and not in reform? You are preaching a reform message. And I said, why should I not be? He said, because there's apostasy in the Adventist church. And I said, well, I saw some little problems there in the camp meeting also in your church. <laughs> And he said, yeah, we have sin in our midst, but we don't condone sin. We rebuke sin. And you guys, you condone sin, now everything is acceptable. And I said, so you're trying to tell me that although both of us have sin, only we have apostasy, and you guys don't have apostasy. And he said, yes. I said, well, then I cannot move to your church. And he said, I'm confused. You like apostasy? I know. But it's prophesied in the Bible that the church in the last days, the church that God established, will have apostasy. If your church is not having apostasy, you're not fulfilling prophecy. You're not the true church. <laughs> I want us to understand that apostasy is part of the church. We are to embrace the church without turning our back to it. We should not embrace apostasy, though, and we should turn our back to apostasy without turning our back to the church. We have to understand this balance. Some people, if they find some defect in their wives, they leave them. But this is not the way Christ works. So I want us to understand that the Bible shows us about special selections. And I want to take this a little bit further. Um, the word or call that is given by the Holy Spirit is acknowledged by the church when we take care of those roles that were not given to us and we take them upon us or say that we don't need anybody else to do it, those that are in leadership or those that are in some position we don't need it, we can bypass them because they are just faultful men. We don't notice, but we are not only robbing their authority, but we are robbing God's authority. Let me give you a little illustration that will help you understand. Let's say the President of the United States, and I'm not meaning this President, I'm meaning any President, is in corruption. And now is in the news, it's not fake news, everybody knows that he's receiving, uh, you know, bribes, and he's in corruption totally. So what do we do now? Do we despise presidency or is just this President? See, we cannot put all in the same basket. Just because we have a corrupt president in a certain situation, that doesn't discard presidency. We must respect the president. If we don't respect the presidency, we are despising 
all the authority of a nation that for years and years established this nation. The president might be going against the Constitution, but the Constitution is still something. We have to understand that even if we have defiled pastors, that is not taking away pastorship. That office has been instituted by God. When we disrespect the office just because of a corrupt pastor, we are disrespecting God. We cannot be blessed with that. So just because somebody in office is not performing their duty, it doesn't mean that we despise the, the office. We will be cursed if we do so. Are you with me with this, what I'm saying? So we have to make a distinction between the person and the office. Sometimes people show me something. Oh, you see, this leader in such and such place did so and so. So what? You see, I've seen ministries that all their focus is to criticize and call sinners by name. Jesus called us to call sin by name, not sinners. Who am I? You know, Daniel was praying, Lord, forgive us our iniquity. Where is his iniquity? Where are the sins from Daniel? He's not considering himself better than others. God told Moses, I'm going to kill these people and make a big nation. And Moses felt, I'm not more worthy than them. If you're going to do that, just remove my name. We are all together in this. When we don't feel we are together in this and we feel better than others, that's when we are worse than others. Amen. The Spirit prophecy says that the first sign that somebody is not sanctified is that, that person thinks he is. You know, movements that think they are going to save the church, I call them two names. And I'm not attacking people. I want you to understand that I'm attacking a concept that is attacking God's concept. I call it um, mushroom ministries. Mushroom. You know what mushroom? How does a mushroom live? Out of the problems of the tree. If the tree dies, the mushroom dies. If the tree becomes healthy, the mushroom dies. Those ministries, they can only flourish while the church has problems. And unfortunately, we are in this world, uh, the church will always have problems, so they think they will flourish. You know, mushroom ministries, that's what they do. Or I call it also Rambo ministries. I'm not calling you to movies, but you remember Rambo, the guy that with a machine gun will kill everybody and think they will save everything. You know, you cannot do the work just by yourself. <laughs> and you kill everybody, and now, yeah, so what? Who's going to take the nation now? Who's going to bring the flag? We need the church. People confuse the militant church with the victorious one. We didn't win this battle yet as a church. We are still working on it. God is still working on us. So I want to bring you into some thoughts into that, and I would like you to understand. I want to bring you to a very important text that is in Numbers 16. I would like to ask you to open your Bible in Numbers 16. Of course, we're not going to read all the chapter. We don't want to stay here forever. But I would like us to, to talk about this story. And I'm going to jump in some parts on this text. It starts in verse 1. It says, Now Korah is the first one, then he's going to combine him with other men. We all know the story about Korah, Dayton, and what? Byron. Those men come to Moses and say, verse 3, And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron, and said unto them, You take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy. Every one of them. And the Lord is among them. Wherefore, then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. What they are saying is, hey, why do you guys have to be the leaders? Why do you have to be the pastor? Why do you have to be the elder? You know, we are all a holy nation. We all can rule. We all can do whatever. We are all holy, all called by God. And what is Moses answering him? Verse 8, and Moses say unto Korah, Here I pray you, ye sons of Levi, 
verse 10. And he had brought thee near to him, and all thy brethren, the sons of Levi, with thee. And seek ye the priesthood also? Moses is saying, isn't it good enough that the Lord called you into such an important role as being a Levite? Why do you want to go higher? Why aren't you happy with what the Lord has given you? You see, this is again something that shows us when we are unhappy, we are not unhappy with where we are. If we know the Lord is taking care of us, then we are not happy the way he's taking care of us. Are you with me? Is everybody sleeping? Is this a, a boring topic for you? For me, it's a very interesting one. Because for many years, I was called an offshoot. I was in self-supporting ministry, and I had a lot of people going against me. In fact, 12 years in self-supporting ministry, I only became a pastor when I was 40. So all my life, I was not in pastoral ministry. That's why I can speak so boldly about this, because I know I'm not biased. You can still watch videos from 2004 and see that I'm preaching exactly the same that I'm preaching now. I'm not preaching this because I'm a pastor. I'm not trying to defend my position. I'm preaching this because this is what the Lord has established. So I don't want us to go through all these, but I want you to notice that Moses tells them, bring your censers. So they, they're all holy. They were Levites. And the, Moses said, okay, if I am just veining on my own, then uh, you will die a natural death. If I am not, then you guys will die a, a natural death. And what happened? Do you know this story? What happened? The earth opened and swallowed who? The three of them only? Their families? Their belongings? And you might say, Pastor, are you trying to say that the Lord is going to do that? I'm trying to say that the devil is going to do that. When you start criticizing the church, when you start challenging what God established, you will be swollen. You, your family, or your belongings. I know many ministries that started attacking the church, the wife of Jesus. Their marriages were destroyed. Their homes, all the structure of their life, many of them leave the faith. I met some people that were interpelling me when I was preaching in Brazil, they didn't believe in the Holy Spirit. I tried to warn them. And we were in uh, arguments all the time about the subject. They will come every day before my preaching. A little bit after, his wife got crazy. She will go out naked in the streets, just running. He will have to go after her. I've seen marriages being dissolved. The devil will swallow you because you're exposing yourself out out of the protection of the Lord those were holy men they were called to a holy duty and you know what happened if you read there let me see which verse it is the people got upset with Moses and it says they, they were I'm not finding the verse but they, they say hey you killed holy men so Moses is now the guilty one Another story that goes right in, verse, in, in chapter 17, you know, they were starting challenging, so the Lord said, you all bring the rods, and the one who blossom will be the one that I choose. And the Lord chose Aaron. Now, the spirit prophecy clearly says about Aaron that he was a weak man. He didn't have a stern definition. When the people came and said, we want you to make a little idol for us, he didn't feel like, no, this is wrong. Say, okay, yeah. And then when Moses came down and said, yeah, well, they pressure me, you know. The Bible says, uh, the spirit prophecy says that God knew about that, but still chose him because wanted to represent that Jesus took our weaknesses to represent us. So I want us to understand, sometimes when we get married, Although we are imperfect, but we wait and expect our spouses to be perfect. Does that happen? That's, uh, I, I expect my wife to be perfect. And when she says I'm not perfect, I feel like, hmm, what's something wrong with those glasses? You know, we feel like, we, if, we, we all say, I, I know I have defects. You know, but you don't feel them. <laughs> I'm living my defects all my life long, so I, I'm used to them. But my wife's defects, you know, 
And the same thing happens when we come to the church. We all know that none of us is perfect, but we look at the leaders, we look at the elders, we look at the pastors and get surprised. He's not perfect. Look at this and this and that. You know? You know, Adventists, they like barbecue. Leadership barbecue. We're going to burn them down. Oh, yeah. Those imperfect ones. You see, we should lift them up. You see, when Moses is there praying for the nation, his arms are getting tired. They came to help him up. The pastor, the elders are praying for you. Do you need to lift them up? You know that they are striken down by the devil. Their families are attacked like your family would not be. The Lord puts higher responsibilities. You see, all the people were crooks in Israel, and they didn't enter the promised land. And Moses, just because he hammered the rock, you're out. You're a leader. You cannot do that. We expect more from you. Can you imagine that? All these people were complaining and complaining and complaining, Moses patiently taking that. And just because of a little mistake, because the Lord is not taking it lightly, the responsibilities that goes in the shoulder. I've shared this before, and I don't think that I'm saying, oh, poor me, I'm a pastor, you don't know what I go through. That's not what I'm doing, okay? But sometimes I go here, I hear the problems from Sister Danielle, then the problems from si Brother Paul, then the problems from Brother Bland, then I keep hearing the problems. When you go home, you think, I shared my problem. It's like, I, it's the only problem I heard. And now I take all this. If you look at my pictures when I came to the district, you see the difference in my hair? <laughs> if you look, for instance, at the pictures of Obama when he entered the office and when he left the office, <laughs> they will tell you the burden of leadership. The burden of leadership. You are never good enough. And sometimes it's good enough that, it's bad enough that you are not feeling good enough. You know, sometimes you are already frustrated with the things that you're not being able to accomplish. And instead of making it easy, this happens in marriages because it reflects the same thing. Instead of making it easy, we put more burden into it. I'm about to finish. 20 more minutes, I'll be done. Uh, I would like us to reflect upon this problem. Apostasy is not a new problem. It has always existed. We see Ophni and Phinea, we see Nadab and Abihu, we see Israel rejecting the prophets, they killed Jesus. I want you to understand that Israel did a lot and Jesus still didn't reject them. Even when they killed Jesus, God didn't reject them. So God has some patience and tolerance, but what I want you to reflect today is about something that we find in the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel 28. And I'm going to emphasize verse 11, but we all know this story. This happened, in fact, twice, okay? Saul was persecuting David. Was Saul a good guy, Brother Paul? Saul. Not Saul, the, uh, the, 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 the preacher. I'm saying the king. In the beginning to start off with. Many of us, we are like that. Good to start off with, right? It's hard. Look at this. David was anointed, so he could say, I'm the king. The Lord chose me. Saul was persecuting him. Everybody knows Saul was a crook. Everybody knew that. Now, two episodes happen that it's like a given present. One, Saul is going to the cave to do what he has to do, and all the armies there from David, they could kill him right away. Here it goes. No more persecution, no more problem. And the other, he was sleeping, he went with his servant and saw him sleeping. There was only the general there with him. He could kill him right away. But what he says in verse 11, can someone read it out loud for me, please? Verse 11. Oh, I'm sorry, I have the wrong, uh, I said 28, but it's 26, 26, 11. 1 Samuel 26, 11. That's the... In this episode, he takes the spear. In the other episode, he cuts a little bit of his cape. You know, what does the cape represent? 
kingship, your dressing. What does the dressing represent? Righteousness. He's showing that there was a hole in his righteousness, but he didn't attack him. We are not called to say everything is okay, everything is done is okay, but we are called to respect the office, to respect the structure, the organized church. I'm not talking about people here or positions. I'm talking about the church structure. If you attack that, you attack everything. If you attack your constitution, your presidency, you attack everything. You have nothing to cling to. This is what is happening with our nation. We are not understanding the roles and positions just because of people. Look, I want to jump because I had a lot more to say about this, but I see time will be against me. I want to share with you the burden that is in my heart. From the 12 years that I was in self-supporting ministry, and I want to make a decision between self-supporting ministry and independent ministries. You know, self-supporting is supporting the church in its mission and working with the church. Independent ministries are working on their own, doing their own thing. They do like in the book of Judges. Everybody does what is right in their own eyes. They are not accountable. There's nobody to tell them what to do. Nobody's going to put the hand on them. They don't have to respond to anybody. They're so faithful, they're going to do the job by themselves. They are the Rambos. All throughout the 12 years I was in self-supporting ministry, I never took pastorship on my own. That was not my call. I was not anointed to do that. I never took tithe or administered tithe on my own. I never received uh, any invitation to baptize anybody, to perform any sacraments or minister, until the Lord called me into a pastoral ministry. What I want us to understand is that the two things that lead people into independent spirit, and we find that also in the church, is pride and financial interests. It's not the Lord. Some people want to be more than what the church acknowledges them to be or more than what they can be or were called to be. And many of them, they criticize the problem of the church because that will put money into their ministries. I want you to listen. I'm going to read two or three quotes from the Spear of Prophecy about this. And I can tell you the reference if you want to check them at home. I'm going to read only parts. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 9, page 260 and 261. God has ordained that the representatives of His Church from all parts of the earth, when assembled in a general conference, shall have authority. When you despise all the structure of the Church, you're saying, I'm smarter than anybody in the worldwide Church, even those that live before us in all the centuries that they gathered in a general conference. Because what we are as a church now is what the Lord guided us to and brought people from all, brought people from all the world to make decisions in committees, in representations of the church. So what I'm saying is I'm smarter than all of this. I know better than all of this. I'm going to read another text. Councils to the Church, page 246. Those who are inclined to regard their individual judgment as supreme are in grave peril. It is Satan's studied effort to separate such ones. Did you hear this? Who is the inspiration for the separation? Satan. Studied effort. Just some more. This one is his Gospel Workers. Uh, page 487 on. Some add advanced, please listen to these texts. I think it's one of the most important ones. It will give you a clear picture of what is really happening. Some have advanced the thought that as we near the close of time, every child of God will act independently of any religious organization. But I have been instructed by the Lord that it is... In this work, there is no such thing as every man's being independent. Wow. 
Is this strong enough or clear enough? Look at what he says in the next paragraph. The spasmodic, fitful movements of some who claim to be Christians are well represented by the work of strong but untrained horses. If man will not move in concert in the great work for this time, there will be confusion. Sometimes I might get in trouble for preaching not more in code, but sometimes I get a little bit tired of coding. Do you see confusion all around? Everybody thinks he's right. Everybody has his own church. Everybody has his own thing doing. We don't want to work with others. We don't synchronize with others because we're doing what is right. Confusion will be. Look at what she says, still, page 487. Some workers pull with all the power that God has given them, but they should not pull alone. They should pull with their fellow laborers. And she says, as we near the final crisis, which will be more systematic, and I'm going to read the last one on her quotes, Last Day Events, page 51. It's from Selected Messages, volume 2, uh, page 63. The Lord has a organized body through whom he will work. His church is not to be disorganized. You know, Doug Batchelor says that the opposite of God's organized church is Satan's disorganized movement. And this is what we do, although we might be with good intentions. I tell you that the Lord says in the last moments of his life, they shall know you are my disciples. He didn't say, if you move faster than the apostatized church. You know, Caleb and Joshua wait 40 years, although they had a different report from the other leaders. They were patiently waiting with them. You see, some think that Jesus said, they will know you're my disciples if you finish the work by yourself. They will know you're my disciples if you are more consecrated than others. But Jesus says, by this shall men know you're my disciples. If you have what? Love one for another. John 13, 35. John 17, 21 says, this last prayer of Jesus, that they all may be what? One. As thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in this. And Jesus said in this prayer, I pray not only for those that are here, but for all those that through their word will believe in them. I want to close with this thought. Don't you find it interesting that the more we are closing to the end time events, Sunday law and all that is to happen, the more we should and need to be united, the more we are dividing. How does the lion strikes divide the herd to get the one? See, I do believe, and this is why I brought this message to you, I felt impressed that there's a heavy work of Satan at this moment upon the families, the couples, to divide. That's why the ministry of John the Baptist is to bring the parents to the children, the children to the parents. I do believe there is a strong work of Satan at this moment to divide the church because Satan is seeing all that is approaching and he wants us scattered because he knows we have no chance if we go by our own. I don't think it's a moment for us to scatter. She said clearly, some have presented the idea that in the last days we will work each one on our own and scatter. But this is not from God. We need to press together. I would like you to please reflect on this topic as we move along for the new year. We have, as I said, it was a little bit of a long day today. We have one more thing to take care. 
we are approaching a new year, ecclesiastical year. We will have room to have a business meeting to decide on what we're going to do for that and all the issues and topics that we have. Projects that are going on that the church needs to have a word in that. Nevertheless, we had a set of elders, and we had an elder, as a head elder, that resigned, and Brother Tom also resigned, as you know, they left, and we replaced them. We have Brother Abdiel and Brother Matt. At this moment, our church has no head elder. So we'll have to um, elect an head elder and decide what we're going to do if we're going to extend this year leadership or if we are going to uh, just revoke. So I just want to very blatantly said what we were planning to do today was to have, as we finish the service, church members state for us to have uh, a nomination of a head elder. I know I preached a, a large sermon, so I want to ask the church if this is okay, if we still do it, or if we want to do it at the church business. So it's up to us. Those that are church members can express your position or I just don't want to burden you with, with, with something else. I think we should do it now and get it over with. Okay. Since we're here. All right. And I want to, yes. You would rather do it at a business meeting? So let me ask a very quick thing and the clerk can help with that so that we as a church decide those that are church members in this church, you could just quickly uh, express yourself uh, if you would prefer to do it now or in the business meeting. Those who prefer to do it now, please raise your hand. Okay, please keep, keep your hand. As soon as the committee that we have now solves all the things that we have in pendency, so it should be in two weeks or so. Okay. So, Anne, could you please take count? Jo don't, don't lower your hands. All right. Were you able? Just a second. Mine doesn't count, of course. It's just to show what you should do. Okay. Now, those who would prefer, those that are church members, who would prefer to do it in a business meeting, please raise your hand now. I have three here. We have one, two, oh, oh yeah, uh, those two are, are showing upstairs. Did you count here, those three, sister? Please raise your hand as higher as you can, sorry. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to do something. Uh, as the pastor and the chairman, I don't vote, but I have to, when it's something, I have to do the break even. I'm going to use a tricky thing here. I'm going to ask the elders concerning that they are the ones that are going to be voted, what they prefer, if they prefer to have it now or in the business meeting. I think that was a good move, right? Because they are the ones. So if the, the elders who prefer to have it now, the, the elders in office, uh, please raise your hand. Uh, there's, uh, okay, and the others who prefer to have it in the business meeting. Okay, so we'll have it in the business meeting, okay? All right, you put me in trouble, huh, with even thing. <laughs> I apologize to the visitors to bring this topic, but I wanted to say one thing, and I want to say publicly, that's why I was bringing the topic still. We, as elders, we don't all have the same opinion. I think you knew that. I can tell you also about my wife and I, we don't always have the same opinion. <laughs> but I want to tell you publicly, this shall not be a hindrance for us to work together. I'm still working together with my wife. We can still work together with the elders. And we can still work together as a church. So even if the vote was not what you thought, keep in trust that the Lord is leading. And you will soon receive the information about that. We have a closing hymn, and I'm going to invite you
to sing this song. It's a beautiful song. It's not about me leading the church. It's not about what I think should be for my marriage. He leadeth me. 537. He leadeth me. Let's stand and sing together. for the fourth stanza. Father in heaven, you are holy, holy, holy. We come before you to worship your name. We thank you because this church is not led by me, is not led by us, but is led by you. And in spite of our faulty mistakes and leading, you are still the one in charge. And we know by inspiration that in the last days, you will take the reign of the work in your own, own hands. We trust, Father, that in spite of all the turmoils and problems we see, you are the one in control. It's just that you are more patient than we are. We want immediate results. We want problems to be solved right away. But you patiently waited, and you still do. I pray, Father, that you may keep leading us in our personal lives, in our marriages, in our families, and in our church family, that you may help us to understand that we must work together in spite of our differences 
and not scatter. I ask that you might work this miracle in our hearts, the last mileage of sanctification, unity, in Jesus' name. Amen. Wish you all a happy Sabbath. May the Lord bless your day. And you'll be receiving soon information about the business meeting. We have some projects like a church plan that we are dealing with. We have all the things that we need to present to the church as soon as possible. As soon as the committee has everything ready, we'll present it to you. Have a happy Sabbath.